service for Good Friday. The night, of course, when we recall about Jesus going to the cross. We want to reflect on that and both give thanks for his goodness to us and also to note how that way of life lays its challenge, its responsibility on us. But firstly, let's pray. Lord God, in so many different ways, this is the worst of days. Recalling the darkest of moments, the cruelest of events, a day in which hearts were broken and faith tested to the limit, a day of appalling suffering and agonising death, a day when all hell was let loose and Your love seemed overwhelmed. And yet we call this day Good Friday. For in all of that horror, you were there, you were at work. In the despair, in the pain, in the humiliation, in the sorrow. You were supremely at work demonstrating the immensity of your love, the sheer incredible generosity of your love. Living God, as we recall those terrible and yet those wonderful events, as we recall that terrible yet wonderful day, give us fresh appreciation and new insight into what you did on that day, into why you did what you did on that day. Lord, for your glory and for our good. Amen. As they led Jesus away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him, and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the barren women, the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if men do these things when the tree is green, what will will happen when it is dry? Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. 
and they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you're under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. At the foot of the cross Show me your love through the judgment you received, and you've won my heart. Yes, you've won my heart. Now I can trade these ashes in.
At the beginning of the season of Lent, we looked at Jesus um, going into the uh, wilderness, led by the Holy Spirit there, and he was tempted by Satan. Tempted throughout the 40 days he was in the wilderness, but also in particular three temptations that are recorded in, in Luke chapter 4. So we had the baptism of Jesus, temptation with the three particular ones, and then the beginning of his public ministry. And now in the passage that we've read tonight from Luke 23, we have a baptism, not the same kind of baptism, but Jesus back in, in Luke chapter 12 had spoken of how his, his execution, his crucifixion was going to be a, a baptism. He said in, in Luke 12 at, at verse 50, but I have a baptism to undergo and what constraint I am under until it is completed, referring to the cross. So a baptism of a different kind and then again three temptations and then the end of Jesus' public ministry. Three particular temptations in the readings we had where three times as, as Jesus is in excruciating agony on the cross, he's told, save yourself, go on, save yourself. Firstly, at verse 35, it's the religious leaders, and there are echoes of the temptations in the wilderness. If he's God's Messiah, see the question, if he is the Christ, then let him save himself. It's a, how can he possibly be the Messiah and have this happen to him? Just as Satan was basically saying, if you're the son of God, then turn stones into bread. If you're the son of God, how can you possibly be allowed to be that hungry? How can it be so wrong for you to get a decent meal? If you're the son of God, you should be being treated better than this. If you're the Messiah, this cross should not be happening to you. Jesus' way did not fit in with their religious system, which was about power, which was about keeping rules, which was about observation that they did. Nothing to do with grace and generous love, which was the way of Christ. And then secondly, with a, again a similar challenge, king of the Jews, well, if he's the king of the Jews, said the Roman soldiers, then come on, let him save himself. And again, it's about power, isn't it? The, the Roman soldiers were only used to a way of being in the empire where the strong dominated. Kings weren't people who were publicly humiliated and executed. People were people who did the executing, who did the humiliating of others. If he's the king of the Jews. And again, just as the temptations in the wilderness were temptations for Jesus to take shortcuts to be a different kind of Messiah. So there are these temptations as he's on the cross. Save yourself. Come on down. Do another miracle. Show us. But God's Messiah was to bear the penalty and the price of sin. God's Messiah was to die for others. God's Messiah was to show gracious and generous love. And then for the third time, as Jesus is on the cross, Save yourself and save us, verse 39, says one of the thieves next to him. And of course, at that point, he's asking Jesus to do the very thing that Jesus could not do. Jesus could not save himself and save others. He could not save himself and be the saviour of the world. Jesus could not save himself and be able to say, as he did to the other uh, thief at verse 43, Today you will be with me in paradise. That could only be done by Jesus not saving himself. The ultimate here of selfless sacrifice, the undergoing of huge torment and pain, taking cheap jibes and the massive temptation. Come on, get down, save yourself. But Jesus stuck it out. Jesus stuck it out because Jesus is love. Here is huge over-the-top, generous love. We should receive it and be thankful for it. And that is the theme of our next prayer. Let, Let us, us pray. pray. Gracious God, we praise you for the astonishing love we recall today, the love you showed to all humankind through your coming, 
living and dying among us in Christ. We thank you for being willing to endure so much for our sakes, to face the mental agony, the physical torture, and the spiritual torment involved in the cross. But above all, we praise you that you did that through a person as human as we are, experiencing the same temptations, torn by the same fears, sharing the same joys and sorrows, suffering the same pain. You became one with us. May, May we, we become, become one, one with, with you. you. We thank you for the assurance this brings, the knowledge that you understand, the trials and tribulations we go through, the worries, concerns, doubts and problems which confront us each day. We thank you for the inspiration this brings, the example in Christ of humanity at its most selfless, courageous, compassionate and loving. We thank you for the challenge this brings, the call to follow in his footsteps, to take up our cross, to deny ourselves and to offer our service. You became one with us. May, May we, we become, become one, one with, with you. you. You could have disassociated yourself from our sinfulness, yet you identified with us fully. You could have demanded we pay the price for our folly, but you chose rather to pay for it yourself. You could have lectured us about the importance of love, but instead you demonstrated what love really means. You experienced humanity at its worst and revealed it at its best, opening up a new dimension of life for all who will receive you. You became one with us. May, May we, we become, become one with, with you. you. Gracious God, you became human, flesh and blood like us. Accept our praise and receive our thanksgiving through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. But of course, this, this love that Jesus showed for us at Calvary is, is more than something just to simply admire, to receive and, and give him our praise and thankfulness for. When we receive that kind of generous love, it commits us to live that way of selfless humility, that way of over-the-top generosity that way of saying no to temptations and distractions, that way of putting aside all that makes us less fruitful and less effective in the kingdom of God. It is, as we've been talking through this time of Lent, about forming habits, habits that mean we love habitually, that generous loving becomes part of our nature as we commit ourselves to it more and more. A love that makes no sense to the world's power brokers, or even to those desperate to be let off, but a way that makes perfect sense in the kingdom of God, a way that makes perfect sense as a way of reconciliation and a way into fullness of life. So we're going to reflect for a few moments on our responsibilities to love like that and our reflections are going to be shaped around the song O Lord Your Tenderness Lord, Your tenderness Melting all my bitterness O oh Lord I receive So there was Jesus on the cross, laughed at, insulted and mocked, going through extraordinary pain and, and agony, and people were, were just making fun of him. And yet he continued to love. Can we think of, would we bring to mind those who have mocked us? Folks who have had a laugh at our expense. Think of folks 
who have undermined you. Or people who have left us angry and, and disappointed because they haven't seen just how good we are or how much effort we've put in or how much we've done or whatever. Ask God to help us to love such. O Lord, we receive your love that we might be forgivingly loving. Save yourself, they shouted at Jesus, and it must have been so tempting for him. It must have been so tempting to want to avoid this kind of pain, want to avoid this kind of agony. Tempting to have this this process, because crucifixion was a slow business. Tempting to want it to be cut short. And yet he stayed on that cross, refusing the easy way out, because he loved He stayed on that cross refusing the easy way out because he was determined to be a saviour. And we, when we receive that love, are called to be agents of that salvation, ambassadors for that Christ, citizens of that kingdom, showing that kind of committed love that sticks the course. And so let us ask God to help us when we're torn between different choices. Let's ask God to help us when our resolve is weakening and when we are thinking about giving up or we've had enough. Let us seek and ask God's help for, for wisdom to know when we are being tempted, when we are being drawn and dragged away from his calling and, and his will for us. O oh Lord, we receive your love that we might be resolutely loving. Lord, your tenderness melting i uh-huh.